We take a single episode of a science fiction TV series and overanalyze it to within an inch of its life. This is the Fusion Patrol Podcast. Welcome to the discussion. Hello and welcome to another episode of Fusion Patrol. I'm Eugene. And I'm Simon. And welcome back to the show, listeners. Uh, tonight we are going to be talking about the Prisoner episode, Dance of the Dead. Or as autocorrect on my iPad typed it in, Dance of the Dentist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know with the Prisoner, do you? Sometimes. Sometimes it's true. Um, start with a summary of the episode. It is night in the village, and number six is sound asleep. A group of doctors enter his room and connect him to electronic equipment. In the control room, a doctor uses Dutton, a former associate of number six, to attempt to interrogate him, despite the obvious nervousness of this night supervisor, because the doctor clearly doesn't have permission from number two to interrogate six, and the standing orders are not to use techniques that could kill or damage six in any way. The interrogation is failing, and number two arrives just in time to stop it. Number six must come over to their side willingly. It may take a long time, but he will. It is morning in the village, and everyone is preparing for the carnival. Number two talks with number six. She encourages him to come to carnival and find a nice, unattached female. Number two suggests a group of suitable young ladies at a table, but instead, number six goes to talk to the one girl number two said was unsuitable. Is he doing what he wants to be an individual, or has he been played into doing what number two wants? Even number six isn't sure. The girl evades talking to number six and gets away as soon as possible. Number six follows, but Rover slows him down, but doesn't stop him. Eventually, the girl enters town hall. Number six is stopped by an electronic force field at the door. Only authorized people are allowed in. Inside the control room, it is revealed the girl number six was following is his observer. Later, number six comments to the maid that he never sees night, just sleep. He realizes then that they drug him every night. That night, he doesn't drink his nightly drink, and he goes to sleep on the chair. After a while, a hypnotic voice enters his room. He resists and finally leaves via the window. His observer sees this and reports it to number two, but she is unconcerned. Their security will stop him, and he will eventually return to his room, the only place he has to go. Rover meets Six on the beach and dogs him until he gives up. But rather than returning to his room, he sleeps on the beach. In the morning, he finds a dead sailor washed ashore. From the body, he retrieves a small radio and his personal papers. He hides the body in a cave. Returning to his room, his costume has arrived for carnival. He will be going as himself. Later, he attempts to use the radio. It works, but the signal he picks up speaks in a curious, nonsensical way. Number two and the observer arrive. Number six hands over the radio. Later, though, Six takes a life preserver from the stone boat and returns to the cave. He writes a note, attaches it to the body, ties the body into the life preserver, and sets it to float on the tide. Dutton is watching him. They talk. Dutton has been here for a while. He admits to telling them everything, but he doesn't know what they want. Soon, they will kill him. At the carnival, Six dances with his observer, but when she won't give him information, he leaves and starts exploring Town Hall. Most of it is locked, but he finds his way to the morgue, where he finds the body of the dead sailor he set out to see. Number two is there, and she explains that, after some work, that body will be him. He will be dead to the outside world. Returning to the carnival in time for the promised cabaret, the entertainment, turns out to be the trial of number six, his crime, having a radio. Prosecution is his observer. His defense is number two. Number six calls his own witness, Dutton. But when Dutton arrives, he is a drooling idiot, dressed as a fool. Number six is sentenced to death at the hands of the villagers. They chase him with murderous intent. He eventually escapes into the room where he thinks number one is, but it is just a teletype. He destroys it. Number two comes in to tell him that he's dead now, and the broken teletype starts to work again. Number six is still a prisoner in the village. So did you uh, notice that this was written by the same author who wrote Many Happy Returns last week's episode? I didn't spot that, no. Same guy, uh, Anthony Skeen, I believe it is, um, which just goes to show you he has more than one style uh, in, his, in his arsenal. So uh, what did you think of this episode? Well, one of the one of the things that struck me most about it was it feels really out of sequence. It's, oh yeah, it seems 
Ter- I mean, I one of the early episodes, I remember commenting, uh, it might actually have been The Chimes of Big Ben, I remember commenting that number six seemed to have been in the village for a while. He was behaving a bit like an old lag. He had that kind of uh, very suspicious temperament. He knew his way around. He knew how to behave. And of course, it's it, it's perfectly possible that between the, the first episode, which introduces the village, and the second episode, you could say several months have passed by. But then along comes an episode like this, where there are a number of things. I mean, he, he, he actually says that he's, he's new here, but also the fact that he discovers that he's being drugged every night. Um, mm-hmm. the, he- the kind of dawning of ideas that he might be, you know, is, is he rebelling against number two or did number two expect him to rebel like that? Now, that's Getting exactly- into town hall. It's like, this is like the first time he's ever seen town hall before. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And, and, and some of those things are, it, I mean, they feel like, uh, very typical uh, prisonerish things. The idea that maybe he's being led a certain way, even though he thinks he's exploring or being, being able to break into a, a, a hidden room or whatever. But in fact, he's being led. Th- those kind of things are very much what we have seen in all the other episodes that we've watched already. But these episodes seem, um, or this this episode at least, it seems a bit mild. I suppose is the word by comparison. Um, so, some of, some of the other episodes have had far more complex and opaque kind of double, triple bluffs in them than what we're getting in this one. Yeah, and I and I agree that this this does feel well out of well out of sequence. I would almost say that this episode is would should be second or third in yes. sequence because we're setting up the notion that he is dead to the outside world. Which yes, is, yeah, that's another another kind of introductory you know, thing that we haven't we haven't had. And let me say the town hall. He just realizes that basically he's being drugged every night. Um, he has cottoned on that the TV is uh, constantly watching him because he, he just turns to number two on the screen and talks to her as if he knows she's there. Mm-hmm. And he says, how did I sleep last night? And, you know, instantly she's there to answer his question. Um, it, Free for All was also an episode that I felt had been held back a little too long in terms of his getting accustomed to the village. And, and we're also kind of back to that in free for all it was a lot about was it democracy and again we have a lot of talk about democracy in this episode even though yes yes number 2 oblique. says we are a de- we are a democracy which is a an interesting thing to say if this one takes place after free for all right right so i i and he you know he yeah everything about this episode just screams really really early and I think it's a mistake to have held it back. I think it's very jarring yes, when you yes. come at it as episode eight and you're like, you just now figuring that out. I thought you were the smart guy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, yes, it does. It does feel completely wrong. And it's not that in any way it's not an enjoyable episode. And I think when we discussed free for all and maybe then mentioned the fact that it was an earlier episode, I think it's early in the production order as well, isn't it? Um, yes. That the network people might have decided to hold it back because it wasn't as strong an episode as some of the others. So they were they were bringing forward some of the show that they wanted to, as it were, showcase to hook the, the viewers who were still deciding whether it was a good show or not. But to me, this one, I thought it was a, a very enjoyable episode, certainly not one of the strongest, but um, nor was it one of the weakest. And because of all of the introductory elements, I think it would have made a, a good episode too. And it, and, it, and it would have been much more enjoyable in that position because because of all of these things being new to us the viewer just as they were they were new to number 6 the prisoner i am not a big fan of this episode uh there there's a it's it's low on my scale of of enjoyable episodes in in the prisoner but i will say this one probably benefits more from repeated viewing because it it's very um it's unclear to me what dance of the dead refers to um, on first viewing of the episode. And, and really, as I've gone through it a few times, it's like, oh yeah, there's, 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 there's far more references to that. I, I think the choice of, I think the choice of Peter Pan and Bo Peep were probably the biggest mistakes 
Because otherwise, basically everyone's a historical figure. Historical figures are all dead. Um, it is, number six is coming to this as himself, a live man, and joining the ranks of the dead. But I didn't, uh, I, I just basically put it off as, frankly, too many drugs when the guy was writing it the first time I watched it. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is one of those episodes that people go, I just can't make sense out of the prisoner. It, it just like, I, I either, referring to that quote from um we had last week about whether or not people don't understand what's going on, I felt there was a lot of loose ends in this story that just really didn't, you know, they were surrealistic. Maybe, maybe I, I wasn't paying I think enough that's attention the, then. I, I, I feel that the, they were, this one's one of those ones where the, the village has taken on a altered, an altered state of reality, kind of. And so you can't quite expect it to make it, make perfect sense. But, um. It, to me, it seemed quite as, I hesitate to say this, but a relative, for the prisoner at least, a relatively straightforward episode. Did they place the body there for him to find? In, in the morgue. In, no, or, in the water. Oh, in the water. In the first place. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, they could have done, but in a way that doesn't matter. Because it, this, this whole thing to me feels like they are, like I said, a, as, as the dance of the dead and he's coming as himself, the, the dead man, as it were, that started earlier in the episode. So it feels like they were planning a, his trial all the way. They were talking about the cabaret at the very beginning and he is the cabaret. So it feels like they've led him to the point where he's going to be convicted of having that radio. But to do that, he had to find the radio. Oh, but they so could the body have had to be there. They could have convicted him of anything because I suppose uh, presumably the sentence would be death, whatever minor transgression. Certainly having a radio doesn't deserve such a severe sentence. So I don't think they'd have had a problem finding something for him to be guilty. But also I, I did kind of feel that that trial seemed to me not that significant it almost seemed to be a way of passing the time at the party because again I, I, I don't know whether if you were viewing this as the second episode you'd think about it in this way but it, as it's mentioned in this episode and as it has been hammered home so many times to us if we've seen more episodes they're not going to harm number six so the idea that he was sentenced to death you know is going to be some kind of game Mm, yes, yes, I suppose. Um, yes, I, I, I certainly further along down the line. If it was in the second episode, I mean, they have they tell us at the beginning of the episode in no uncertain terms. He's he's too valuable. We don't want to harm him. That's that whole kind of out of place sequence in the middle of the night. Yeah, where they. Uh, you know, make sure there's no physical. To and again, that that kind of falls back to the what should be explained in the first episodes. This person is too important; we can't damage him. So it sets up the premise. But at the same time, is it not possible that there is some actual physical jeopardy for him? I mean, they keep telling him that there are things that could happen that if he doesn't come around, he could end up dead. And so, do we take it from this that? Even though number two doesn't want him dead, and even though they don't want to harm him, it is possible that he'll die, and that gives us some opportunity for number six to escape from peril that really is there, as opposed to a peril that's stay. For example, he could easily have died in many happy returns out on that ship for that raft. Yes. There's, their plan involved a certain amount of risk that could have killed him. So they were willing to gamble with his life to a point. So they could be, uh, and particularly if it's an earlier episode, you don't know that you know there there's a real chance of him dying. There's a real chance that Rover might kill him, even though Rover's not supposed to kill him. I mean, there's all of these things could happen. So I I don't know. I I it felt like it felt like at the end that number two was telling him that now that he's dead, the villagers aren't going to chase him anymore. But that kind of implies that they were going to chase him until he died, which means they are out of out of her control or under the control of the order of the court. However, you want to look at that. So, I don't know. But I don't. Be, I mean, we, in Arrival, we saw Number Two absolutely controlling all of the villagers, so that didn't really seem to be that credible. 
Well, and and we see that in this episode too. For example, when the town crier is uh, declaring carnival and everyone is, they're not happy. Those are those are ghastly passive faces who yes, are it reminded, doing what they're told. It reminded me of uh, the Happiness Patrol from Doctor Who. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Just thought you'd want to be reminded of that too. Thank, thank you so much. Yes. No, no I've got an unhappy passive face. No. <laughs> um, the cat. I didn't mention the cat in the synopsis, but there is a cat in the episode. Is the cat symbolic of his observer? The cat is number twos. The cat is following him around. Um, the cat likes him ends up liking him and even uh, in the morgue number two says that yes the cat's mine she's i'm jealous she's grown attached to you um but she's she's one of she's mine and she's very ruthless and number two or number six says uh never trust a female even the four-legged variety but she could be describing the observer as well the observer is works for her the observer is following him around mm. and she too has become attached to him mm. absolutely and of course, the cat is mystical because number six jumps out of his window and the cat's on his bed. And 30 seconds later, the observer calls number two and the cat's sitting in her lap. Yeah, I, I don't understand. That, I think that's cats. a continuity. <laughs> I think that's a continuity gap. I don't no, think the I, cat was able to teleport, but, uh, unless I, it's a I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past them, you know, cats say, eh? wouldn't put it past them. <laughs> Not a cat person, huh? <laughs> um, but now you know why, because they're, uh, between this and uh, survival on Doctor Who, another Sylvester McCoy reference in a single yes. episode of The Prisoner. Um, let's see, what else have we got on this episode? Um, I, what, so the maid, the maid, she she comes in in a in a outfit earlier, and then and she's explaining how you know excited she is for going to the carnival, and then the next time she's not wearing her maid outfit, and the prisoner asks her. And she says, oh, I got a new costume for this special event. And, of course, now that costume turns out to be um, who she goes as, who ultimately ends up being a judge against uh, number six. So I think it's that point in the story that we know that it's all leading towards his trial, for sure. So maybe, I don't know, you know, where is that? Was that after he found the radio? It might be. It was, yeah. So they might have altered their plan. I forget who she went as now. Um, I'm, I'm not too good on recognizing this, but could it have been Elizabeth first? Oh yes, yes, yes. Of course, that's right. She was wearing a yeah. She was wearing a yeah, Queen Elizabeth outfit, right yeah. kind of hair. <laughs> yeah, she's far better looking than Queen than uh, Elizabeth the first ever was. Uh, was my understanding. Um, because I watch horrible histories. <laughs> anyway, um, well, I haven't yes. seen that, but she certainly was very pretty. She, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Napoleon, and Julius Caesar. So all three dead historical figures passing judgment, which is, uh, according to the writer, he stole that from some film. And I don't remember which film it was, but it was a 1940s film in which three dead historical figures pass judgment on somebody. It's it's experimental film. Uh, he The, the writer ooh, ooh, ooh. also said that he wrote this with... Is it a matter of life and death? That sounds right. That that actually sounds right. I'm gonna have to Google this afterwards. I think it might be a matter of life and death. <clears throat> I think so. There was also another uh, a filmmaker, uh, French filmmaker Cocteau. I can't pronounce it. It's French Cocteau. Cocteau something of that yeah. nature. Uh, this script was based on his works. He he was trying to to evoke that sort of uh, vibe, I guess, uh, in the in these films. So I, you know, of course, how well the writer can do that without the director being on board. And I'm not saying the director wasn't on board, but <laughs> you know, you can, you can, you can write a script and you can say, this is all very surreal. And then the director can shoot it very not surreal. And, um, oh, anyway. um, not in the prison, I say. <laughs> <laughs> they say some, epi like many happy returns, totally, totally straight. I mean, True. that was a, an action adventure story from where go, but you come with something like free for all or for dance of the dead. And there is just this sort of, I, I, I hate continuing to use the word surreal because it's not quite what I'm going for, but unreality to it. Um, when the prisoner is sentenced to death, what does he do? He walks out of the room 
And it's not until he gets past the doors, then it's like robots being turned on and the villagers chase him. So with no apparent signal from number two or anything like that. So there is, there is this stage drama unreality to it that, that wouldn't probably have happened if this were an actual village of prison and even brainwashed imprisoned people so yeah but in in a way that's part of why it feels to me like quite a good episode number two to have because if you watch it in the in the uh, original broadcast order or in the the itc intended broadcast order where um the chimes of big ben is number two then immediately you're taken it's another action adventure story you're you, immediately you're taken out of the village you go um th- through all the sequences at sea and uh and end up in london or so and, and then at the end obviously you get the reveal about it. all of that is out of the village um but you've only just arrived in the village it's only been introduced in the pilot episode arrival so having an episode that is entirely set within the village and has this kind of heightened reality seems like a more appropriate second episode and i'm just looking at the production episode order this is third right after free after free for, right yeah so i mean the production yeah. order doesn't necessarily reflect the the intended broadcast order and obviously from the the sound of the the controversy that surrounds this that would be far too easy for the the prisoner there are way too many columns in the wikipedia list of list of prisoner episodes saying which order it could possibly be in um for any sane tv show yes uh, the, the 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 prisoner society who whose ep- episode ordering i believe was used for the DVD discs, is that right? Or the... I think I read that, yes. Um, has it in third place after free-for-all, same as the production order. But a couple of the other lists actually have it in second place, and that seems to me quite appropriate. Yeah, yeah, it's it's certainly... It certainly feels second. It, it even feels earlier to me than free-for-all did. Yeah. So, uh, although in free-for-all, I think he does ask him if he's settling in okay so that would that would imply a very early episode yeah but but another thing and and this is something that has in common with free for all but which wasn't there in in chimes of big ben at least as much i felt is that um in this episode you do get a very real sense of number six engaging and and dueling much more with with number two so and, and obviously number two is the most important character if it's a single character if he she is a single character but the the certainly um the uh, what do we call it the most important role position um besides number six in the series Mm -hmm. and in and in some episodes plays a a minor or or surprising role or the twist about who number two turns out to be this is a a much more sort of straightforward one with a a good kind of uh confident performance from mary morris so you get much more of a sense of a battle between two powerful people if that makes sense and that seems like a good introductory thing given the nature of the series speaking of um Speaking of important characters in this episode, number one gets a little bit more of a name check, um, even if not by name or number in this episode. There's there's a more clear indication that number two has routine and regular communication with number one. Mm, yeah. And uh, and reports regularly like there is a scene. First off, we the reason that at the end the prisoner gets into a room where he thinks number one is, although it's not obvious to me how he figured that out but um but we the audience have seen it a couple times through the course of the episode where number two is going in and uh like that the uh, doctor who was trying to uh interrogate him early in the episode is asking you know for to get instructions from whoever she's going in to see in this room so there's also a scene and i think it's very telling she's on the phone to number one clearly and she says you know, oh yeah, carnival's tomorrow night, everything's great. Um, yes, yes, I wish you could be here too. And then hangs up, and immediately her expression is one of enormous relief that number one's not going to be there. <laughs> um, it's, I'm not sure what to take out of that, really. Is it number one is so fearsome and formidable, or is it that, well, you just, you know, sometimes there's bosses you just never want to see kind of thing 
I, I don't know. I, you know, it just it just adds another dimension to that dynamic between number one and number two. Well, certainly reflecting on on the the dynamic from A, B, and C with uh, Colin Gordon's number two, you certainly have the impression that number one is a fairly fearsome and unforgiving boss. Yes, yes, I get I get that. But in those episodes, um, number two's not making any progress. Yeah, I mean, we as the audience know that number two has actually got something to be worried about. Yes. I think. Yes. In this episode, I didn't, not so much. It just sounded like, you know, number one kind of casually says, yeah, I wish I could come by and visit for that. And number two's like, oh, I don't want you here. Yes, yeah, sir. That'd be great. It'd be <laughs> terrific. Sorry you can't make that for whatever reason. So uh, again, kind of an earlier, an earlier episode feel like we're explaining more things than we needed to. Speaking of name checks, I, mm-hmm. it did seem to me that um, and I, I, this didn't really make much sense to me because it's obviously quite important, the, the numbers in the village. But Dutton kept getting called Dutton, not number 34 or whatever he was. And yet Julius Caesar at one point said, no names, we don't use names here. Yes, I mean, it, it, get, it gets mentioned as a rule. And of course, having seen the other episodes, we're very familiar with it. But the um, the death notice or whatever, it, it, is, it doesn't say number 34. It says Dutton's full name on it. And you, you wonder, you know, if that were number six, if they ever decided they'd had enough of him and number six was for the chop, would the would the decree come through with his full name printed on was it? Was he 34? Wasn't he 34? I I'm, I never I never was able to pick up his number but 34 was the 34 was who the girl observer was watching before number 6. Yes. And he's well she's told he's dead. I don't know. Maybe I maybe assumed that I assumed that was a reference to Dutton. I realized that he was seen alive after that point, but I thought that she was just being a bit previous. Huh. No, I as didn't. In he's I, good as dead. That that would fit as well, but I just didn't. I never saw a number, and I never got. Hmm, could be right. Might try to go back and watch that again and see if there's a, see if he's got a number on him somewhere. But I don't even remember seeing him wearing a badge when he was on the beach or at the cave. No, no. I mean, and he part, never calls himself. But, no, he doesn't call himself by a number, and the prisoner obviously calls him by a name. And and it's another of those unusual occasions where. We have someone who the prisoner, I mean, we had it in Arrival in the pilot. Mm-hmm. We have someone who the prisoner actually knows from life before the village. So that, it, from that point of view, it kind of makes sense that he still has a name in the prisoner's eyes. But why the the villagers should actually use his real name so often did seem a bit incongruous to me. Yes, and I don't know. I really don't know. Unless it was... Even that doesn't make any sense. I was gonna say, what I was going to say is, you know, unless it's part of the game to play on number six, but I don't, I don't know what that would be. I just, it's just in Congress, out of place. Um, yeah. So if he was thirty-four, that would kind of make sense because it, he, you know, you, you could say that he, the man who number thirty-four was, is dead. In in that way, in a, in a sort of symbolic way, he's now there. They're drooling, drooling fool. Mm. Although I'm not sure what that scene was supposed to tell us. It's like, are we just saying we've been playing you for a fool, number six? Is that simple? Or, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, think, I think it was more of a sort of combination of a, a warning and, uh, you know, you can't, uh, well, you can't win, I suppose. There's, you know, your witness won't do you any good. And by the way, we're about to kill you. So, <laughs> yeah. So we didn't need to teach you this lesson because you're a dead man. I uh, yeah, I am. Uh, thing. Um, couple couple production points I'll throw out from looking through the looking through the script again, uh, which was a, an earlier draft apparently in the book in the script book this time. So it's got some, it's got to change. One was that M or M. <laughs> Number two was um <laughs> was a man in it. Um. And uh, was not that that really made much difference, but it did change the costume. M, or M. Wow. We're just going to keep calling it M for today, aren't we? M because of Mary Morris is actually not Miles Messervy or uh, Judy Dench, which doesn't have an M in it. But um, 
Dame, Dame, Dem, Dame with an M. It's an M in there. Um, was Jack the Ripper instead of Peter Pan? Oh, well, that would have fitted with your dead theory. Um, also, Mary Morris did a very controversial in 1947 version of Peter Pan. Oh. In which she played a Peter Pan as a gypsy boy. Something like that. And I'm not too familiar with this. I'm just getting some background from from the, the cliff notes. And even as late as 1967, that was considered one of the most controversial portrayals of Peter Pan ever. So whether or not there's anything to that, whether Mary Morris picked her own costume, whether or not the production crew said, hey, this is, you know, kind of, we can do Mary, Peter Pan. I don't know. Um, I kind of like, you know, Jack the Ripper, how would you know? Really? How would you know yeah, it's Jack true, the Ripper? True. Just just a guy in a top hat and a cape and what I look at. So that's um that was one thing that came out. Um there's an interesting cut line from the trial where the observer says he got I don't know from where because he hasn't been interrogated a radio. Right? And the doctor, so Napoleon, I guess you want to call him in this case, says, Why wasn't he interrogated? None of us are safe in our beds until everything is known about everyone here. Which, is, you know, keeps with the whole, you know, we we know everything, we control everything. But it's, it's interesting that he casts that in the role of public safety. Mm. Um, you know, here is, here is a show, even if you want to, can, can you, let's ask this question. If this uh, show had taken place in modern times... Do you think that number six, before he was taken to the village, would have had a Facebook account? Because I'm thinking no. I'm thinking no Twitter, no Facebook. You know, that that does not – he he definitely has that privacy if, vibe. Yeah, if you updated the show, but you didn't update Patrick McGowan, I think, no, he probably wouldn't. I somehow can't imagine it. He he really has that that I'm just – you know, tightly control about everything. Or either that or he'd have like the world's most boring Facebook wall. Because <laughs> it wouldn't it wouldn't have anything on it except like one word answers. <laughs> um so yeah, it it's here we can look at this and, and and still draw a parallel. I have to give the credit the show credit because it it does provide us with things that we can look at today and still ask about our society it hasn't it hasn't aged out of relevancy as some as some shows do so you can ask questions about whether or not you know do we give up privacy for security okay that's probably has been going on for a long time but um and you can you can put it in context today not that i mean obviously it's perfectly safe with the nsa mm-hmm. but uh you know who else might have the information Anyway, uh, that was one. Uh, another was, did you notice the weird dancing when, when number six was dancing with his observer? At he the wasn't carnival? really dancing. It was a very, st- and it was very strange. He was kind of walking around. People were sort of milling around doing sort of different steps. It was, it was all very chaotic or, and yet somehow, cause it was like, felt like it was going around in a ring, almost like a race or a, Thing. Uh, he was supposed to be dancing with her. But he wasn't but, really yes. dancing, it didn't seem to me. No, he was supposed to be dancing with her in the script. Proper dancing. Oh, I see. You mean in terms and he of wouldn't the production? Do it. Oh, he right. I do it. Um, so McGowan wouldn't do it. Because, I correct. mean, within, within the story, obvious, obviously number two is telling number six to go and dance with her. Mm-hmm. And it appears that he is kind of refusing to do it. But, but yeah, and that kind of fits again with the, the way the game is played in the, I think all the changes that are made to the scripts, and so far pretty much everything I've seen, where they have him doing something, generally speaking, are a little bit of an improvement, or that they're a little bit, they make him a little more consistent across the board. Um, but, you know, this is one where it wasn't for any character, or it wasn't, I guess it wasn't for, I suppose McGowan could say that's my character, but, this was just he refused to do it. So you know, I that's too intimate <laughs> for uh, for being for me. Uh, <laughs> so, like, 
So, um, very strange. And also, the original script did not end where it did. He, uh, now that he's declared dead, he, and the observer has been released. So it's, it's in the original, the observer clearly has become involved with number six emotionally invested in him. And, and the line still remains from number two that says she's no longer your observer because she can't be involved. She can't be emotionally involved. But in the original, number six and the observer walk off hand in hand, return to the carnival, which is full going dance. And they all, they all dance together with Napoleon and, uh, Mar- uh Elizabeth and, and, uh, Julius Caesar. The, the five of them get into a line dance together. And that's where the episode ends. Because <laughs> he's now one of the dead. Although, still, Bo Peep. Come on. People, keep your <laughs> metaphors right or something. <laughs> that one just throws that whole thing off. It's like, yeah, better that they cut that out, but it does make Dance of the Dead more explicit. The, the title of the story and what they're going for. So it also there's again just like in many happy returns there's a few spots along the way where bits have been cut out that make the prisoner more human. He shows more concern for Dutton um both uh at the uh, cave when he says he's going to die and he shows him I think he shows him more concern at the trial when he sees that he's been turned into an idiot. He also has he shows some fear at the trial when he realizes they actually do mean to kill him now. Um, and and we hear more of the note that he wrote in the original script. It says basically, you know, he starts off, whoever may find this, and we hear that part. Then the next scene, he's reading the next part, and he says, I expect that I am to be murdered soon, and I want my killer to be brought to justice. And so I'm leaving this information to... And then in the writer attempting to really be surrealistic, because like I said, can the writer do that? We switch over to the voice of the dead guy, the dead sailor, and he finishes reading the note that as the prisoner is writing it out before it goes off to, he sails out to sea. And it just says, you know, I'm enclosing a map and I'm, I don't know where I am, but maybe you can find this place and, and bring these people to justice. You can't just write in the voice of the dead guy. How on earth are we as viewers <laughs> going to know it's the dead guy's voice? Cause I know. <laughs> I, I mean, we haven't heard a lot from him up to that point. Right, right, exactly. It is a strange, it is a strange, um, idea and it wouldn't have worked. And maybe that's why they cut it. But I think more likely we cut it is that they cut it because the prisoner actually sounds like he's worried. So they're going to kill me. Yeah. Uh, and all of those things tend to get excised from this show um, to make him into more of a, more of a Superman. Exactly. Well, it's the same writer and it's the same situation. Exactly. They, they go through and, and cut it out. Um, let's see. What else did I get out of this? Director never worked for the show again because he couldn't get along with McGowan. <laughs> I'm detecting a pattern here. <laughs> Maybe that's why McGowan gets to direct some episodes is that he just can't get people to work with him. He's obviously um, a, a potentially difficult man to work with. Anyway, as I say, I, I get more out of the episode on a couple of viewings, which I guess, I guess is a good thing. It, it either, or maybe it's a bad thing. Maybe it just says I didn't really get it the first two or three times. Or maybe it says I'm making stuff up. So I feel like I'm getting it or because, you know, this, this was a show that would have, or maybe they failed as a filmmaker because this show wasn't meant to be on a DVD that you could watch over and over or expect somebody here 40 plus years later oh, to well, be talking about. That, that may be true, but I think, I, I mean, I, all of the episodes that we've seen so far, you could imagine watching several times and still find new things in them because they're not not straightforward there's there's a a lot packed in and a lot of complexity particularly compared to other shows of the era so i think whether or not they could have foreseen that these things would be viewed again and again i i don't know but certainly for the the mere mortal viewing them once isn't enough 
Yeah, I think I think that's true. And well, some episodes like the general once is more than enough. But <laughs> <laughs> this one, yeah, I you have to you have to go. I feel you have to go into it with the attitude that they're trying to they're trying to tell you something in a secondhand way as opposed to a, a straight linear narrative like you would in Many Happy Returns, for example. Mm -hmm. I could watch Many Happy Returns many times. I don't think I pick up anything new in it, but it's fresh every time I watch it. I really like that episode. This one, I I, I struggle with it to try to um, make it reconcile in my head. It, it, it's another one of those plots that seems like, is it a plot? I mean, I think I asked that. I mean, are they guiding him to that trial at the end of this episode so that they can declare him dead? Is that the, is that the whole point of this thing from from the word go, or is that just happy happy accident that it comes along that way, or is this is this really something they actually do every year? To it, it didn't feel narrative heavy. Can I put it that way? It, if you're asking about the plot, there's something there, but. In some sense, it felt a bit more like free for all, which I think you described as being a kind of series of vignettes, and they were they were kind of pointed and and designed to be satirical. And in this one, I think they're less pointed, and it's more about just setting the scene and giving the atmosphere of the village and presenting some of the sort of surreal nature of of life there, but. Conversely, it it feels more coherent because of that, because it has a, it has a kind of um, a, a more a slightly more consistent mood to it, I suppose, and it doesn't need to make a point with with every scene. It doesn't need to say um, il all elections are a sham or or, or whatever. Um, it feels like it feels like maybe the the writer and the production just having a bit more bit more fun i suppose and a bit more of an explore of the character and and the environment and so from that point of view i think i i would be quite happy to to rewatch it again straight away and enjoy rewatching it and yes maybe i wouldn't get as much as if i rewatch say free for all but i'd probably enjoy it more i will go with that i would i enjoy this one more than free for all i i, I will definitely go so far as to say that i mean there are things going on in this one that interest me and in free for all they are just sort of here's a scene take my point from it i'm going to hit you over the head with it yes uh, and and that not only gets tiring very quickly but they use an they use too much time to convey each one like the scene with the press reporters okay i got what you're going for i mean it only takes about one question that i realize this is the facet that they're uh, making fun of or, or satirizing. And let's move on to the next one then. It's, it's, it's like they're presenting me a series of bullet points and then they're taking too long to explain the bullet points. It's, it's a PowerPoint presentation is what it is. It's like, okay, click on. I can read it faster than you can read it to me kind of thing. I'm sure that's happened to everyone, right? That, that's what everyone does at a PowerPoint presentation. They bring us, brings it up on the screen. You read it and then Three to five minutes later, the guy who's reading you the thing out loud gets done with it and then moves on to the next screen and you're playing Sudoku or something on the background. <laughs> it's, what I, it's what I do. Um, not saying I did that during free-for-all, but that is kind of the feel I get out of that one. Whereas this one, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of – I'm not really interested in the carnival. That does not interest me. I mean, they, they keep the talk about the carnival, the carnival, the carnival never interests me. In the story, that that's not like something like, oh, I can't wait till we get to Carnival and see what this is all about. It's the other things going on, finding the body, the radio, the girl, the observer, all those things contribute to the plot. And the big, the big thing I'm supposed to be expecting at the end is not, does not grab me throughout the story. And, and then it, it doesn't disappoint me at the end either that it's all a sham. That, you know, everyone's just sitting around waiting for number two and not doing anything until she says, oh, okay, everybody dance. It's like, it's not really a carnival. It's just, it's a stage. It's a set. Okay, that one's, I get nothing more. Absolutely nothing else. Well, I've got, I've got one small question for you, but I, I think, I, I thought for a moment that I, there might be some info in this that hadn't come up before because... When they, at the beginning, they say we mustn't harm number six because we want to use him afterwards. 
And so that set me wondering, well, well, you know, once they've, once they've got the information from him, what is their plan exactly? And the only thing I could think of was, well, they want to send him back to London as a double agent. So I thought, in that case, they can't be, the, the village can't be working for London. It's got to be, it, it, you know, they're not there about finding out why he resigned or what secrets he sold to the other side or whatever. They're not, they're not backed by the British Secret Service. But actually, I think I may have been wrong about that, because if they believed that he was actually passing secrets, maybe they do want to use him as a double. They just want to be able to feed secrets to whoever um, via him, so they would still be using him as a double agent. So I think probably I haven't got anything new there. <laughs> well, I, I, I would say... My thought, and of course this is building upon other episodes that we've seen, like for example uh, in Chimes of Big Ben where number two tells him that the village is a model of society and this is our own, this is our own world. Um, in the real world, we have need for secret agents. And if the village is a model of the real world, uh, number six would be an enormously valuable asset, even, even if it was there in the village. If he was a high level, you know, what if he became number two? He could be, he could probably be a devastatingly effective number two if that's yes, the type of work yes. he wanted to do. So I, I'm not, I'm not sure I ever got the feel that they wanted to send him back. And I, and, and, and as you talk through it, yeah, we, if it's, if they're not being run by London, then I, I have always kind of got the impression that they are being run not by London, not by Russia, but that, they're sort of a tendrils into those organizations kind of thing so that, that maybe London and Russia don't even realize that they're being worked by the village, whatever the village organization turns out to be. So that you can have people in London who are a very high power, whether it's the Colonel or, or Thorpe or I um, can't remember the guy from Chimes of Big Ben right now. Father and Gay, who are there and are genuinely part of the organization, but they are doubles for the village in the first place. So, you know, maybe they do want to put him back working for the village, but not exactly working against London, but, you know, has an extra agenda above and beyond working for London. That's not quite the same as a double agent, but, but again, this is a weird show. So it, I, I don't know what they're going for. Clearly they want to use him, though. Clearly, they think that once he becomes a member of the village society, he will be a productive member of the village society, as opposed to Dutton, for example. Didn't make the grade. Yeah, who they? Yes, they don't think could be useful for whatever reason. But I mean, like I say, even if even if you even if you were a double, you could still read it either way. So even if that were the case, it still wouldn't tell us who mm -hmm. who they actually who who number two is working for. So so it remains a mystery. But we'll see. We'll see. Perhaps, perhaps we'll learn more as the series goes on. <laughs> or perhaps they will just continue to make it um, obscure and ambiguous uh, and all those fun things that we get from that we get from Prisoner every episode. Well, Simon, thank you. It's been a pleasure Enjoy. as always. And uh, we will be back with another episode of The Prisoner one of these days soon. Or something else, or who knows what will be next week? I don't even know what will be next week yet. So, well, when we uh, when we do come back to watch the prisoner, we are actually at something of a crossroads. So if we're going to carry on with the uh, the ITC episode ordering, I think the next episode would be "Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling." Really, the dance. So number episode nine, "Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling." Well, that's an interesting episode. It's, the, it's um, the, certainly the next one in my iTunes, and I think it was the original US Air order. That's the original ITC order, and then that's yeah. supposed to be the syndication order as well. Well, let's do... What would be our alternative approach? Well, if we were to stick with the British Air order... I thought that was the British Air order. It was the British Air order would be the intended. It was the intended um order um so oh, then we'd go with yeah. checkmate yeah checkmate wow that's a big jump that's a big jump because if you go uh if you look at um 
the ITV airing order, we would be checkmate, hammer into anvil, it's your funeral, a change of mind, and then do not forsake me, oh my darling. Let's let's go with the... Let's go uh, with the I- ITC order. ITC number. Let's that, go with that, do not forsake there's me. There's some yeah. intention behind that. Even yeah. even if some of the decisions such as putting Dance of the Dead at number eight are questionable. Yeah. Okay. Do not forsake me, oh my darling, will be the next episode of The Prisoner. That's an interesting one, if I didn't say that. I, I already recognize what's weird about that episode. That's the important parts. Okay. Well, then listeners, we hope you'll join us all again next time on Fusion Patrol. We hope you've enjoyed this retro episode of the Fusion Patrol podcast here at the Fusion Patrol Classics YouTube channel. For new episodes of our audio podcast every week and our entire back catalog, come visit us at FusionPatrol.com or subscribe in iTunes or most anywhere fine or even disreputable podcasts are found. You can also support our podcast at Patreon.com slash Fusion Patrol.